Hello, welcome to the scientist.com webinar series, the three R's of animals and research. This is part one, replacement, presented in collaboration with the NC3Rs and the METIS. Today, we're gonna to have a brief introduction, a replacement overview with Dr. Sam Jackson from the NC3Rs, a section on replacement in practice with Chuan Chiang of the METIS, a question and answer section. For the question and answer, please feel free to type your questions in the box and we will go ahead and answer them all at the end. My name is Megan Loy. I'm the category director of in vivo services here at scientist.com. And that means I'm responsible for anything involving live animals. So whether it's DMPK, toxicology or pharmacology, or even in general animal welfare. Scientist.com is a B2B marketplace. We were founded in 2007 and we're headquartered down in the San Diego area, although we have offices all over the world, including Boston, the UK, and in Tokyo, Japan. We have about 70 full-time employees and over 3,000 global suppliers. We are an online marketplace for R&D outsourcing, so that means we connect researchers from any size organization with a global list of suppliers of custom R&D services. Those services run a wide range uh, through the drug development life cycle, but you can see some sample uh, services down at the bottom. So because animal research is essential to pharmaceutical development, we do a lot of support in this area. And it's our obligation, both moral and ethical, to conduct the, that research thoughtfully. And we support efforts that replace animals, reduce their numbers, and refine procedures wherever possible. So to support animal welfare efforts, we do a few different things, including supplier due diligence, animal welfare information gathering and compilation, and then we host educational programs such as this webinar. This is a three-part series, as I mentioned, on the three R's, hosted by scientists.com and the NC three R's. The first one today is replacement, featuring the METIS. Next, we will have reduction with Hera Biolabs, and then refinement, featuring Sinclair Research. Our first speaker today is Dr. Sam Jackson. Dr. Jackson manages a program of work at the NC3Rs that examines the potential to replace, refine, or reduce animals used, and to model disease, measure efficacy, and examine the safety of new drugs. This includes a lot of different technologies and applications. Dr. Jackson recently organized several workshops and surveys that explore how human tissue is used in cancer research and safety pharmacology, and identified barriers to increase use of that research. Prior to joining the NC3Rs, Dr. Jackson gained 10 years of experience in research through postdoctoral posts in neurobi neurobiology in both academic and industry settings. And without further ado, I'd like Sam to start his section of the webinar. Thanks, Sam. Thanks very much, Megan. I uh, really appreciate the introduction and the invitation to be involved with this webinar series. Um, so I am speaking from uh, the NC3Rs office in London. Uh, it's great to be online and be able to uh, talk to you about today about this important subject um, of replacement. So uh, next slide please. I'm just going to start by introducing a little bit about the organisation that I work for. So we are the National Centre for the Replacement, Refinement and Reduction of Animals in Research. Um, following on from a UK government consultation in 2002, recommendations were given to give greater priority to the development of non-animal methods uh, and the three R's generally in the UK. Um, and to do that, uh, set up a national, national centre for the three R's. So we were established uh, by the UK government in 2004 uh, to lead the three R's agenda in the UK. Um, really, our reach stretches far beyond that into Europe and certainly the US and um, other emerging markets. Uh, we apply the three R's as a framework to support science and innovation uh, and improve animal welfare. We do this through investing in people and in practice uh, through our grant funding programs. Uh, we drive commercialization of three R's relevant technologies uh, through our open innovation scheme, Crackit. And the example that uh, Mimetas will give today uh, was a Crackit funded uh, project, or at least in part. We work uh, right across the bioscience sector uh, with academics and industry uh, involved in biomedical research, uh, all using animals and or alternative methods. And we also work with a wide range of stakeholder organizations outside the biosciences. So for instance, uh, chemicals, agrochemicals, and personal care product industries, all of whom use animals uh, in their work. 
We receive around 10 million pounds a year, um, which we spend on our research funding schemes uh, to support the open innovation platform and to carry out uh, bespoke in-house activities around specific subject areas. And often these involve um, getting together working groups or um, sharing data between parties. And we have, I mentioned I'm in London at the moment. We have around 30 staff based here in our London office um, and five regional posts around the UK. But as I said, we are um, very interested and engaged with um, uh, companies and people outside of, of the UK. So as I mentioned, at the NC3Rs, we um, use the 3Rs as a framework really for, for looking at biomedical sciences. What are the 3Rs? 3Rs are replacement, reduction and refinement. And today we're going to be uh, concentrating on replacement. Um, really, we believe the 3Rs are important for multiple reasons. Um, firstly, they provide an ethical framework within which to critically assess animal use. Um, and this can be done on a kind of cost benefit basis, which is uh, the cost to the animal versus the benefit to science or what we would get out of, of using that animal in that way. Uh, this is, of course, enshrined in, in legislation here in the UK. The Animal Scientific Procedures Act um, is in place to protect uh, animals used in science. Um, there is similar uh, legislation in the EU and in the US, and recently the U UK and the EU have updated this legislation. There is widespread public support for, um, uh, for the three R's. So uh, here in the UK, we have a, an Ipsos Mori poll each year called Public Attitudes to Animal Research. And it shows that public, um, the public support animal use in research only when the principles of the three R's are adhered to. And, um, and the general public also strongly support the replacement of animal testing. So the three R's can also be implemented to improve scientific practice and to build new businesses. And this is certainly part of our role um, here in uh, the NC3Rs in the UK. Um, so defined as non-animal methods, uh, replacement, the NC3Rs, we um, approach this through trying to accelerate the development and use of human relevant tools based on latest technologies. So I just wanted to give some examples of what, what is replacement, what does it look like? Um, in fact, a, an older definition is an experiment which would have been used, uh, would have used animals can be carried out without animals, but as you'll see, there are some animals involved in replacement. I'll, I'll explain that in a second. But really, um, one of the most common ways of replacing an animal is to come up with an in vitro model. So certainly complex in vitro modeling and microphysiological systems, as we can see an example here from Vanderbilt, um, are, are four of this at the moment, and, and then Coupling that with uh, use of human tissue, um, organoids, and, and newer 3D uh, cell culture type techniques, and indeed with um, an increase in the real time on device biomarking, biomarker monitoring technologies um, and sensitivity of those. This allows us to do in, uh, experiments in a reductionist way uh, without using animals to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, also, in silico and computational modeling and math, model, math models are coming to this area um, and the buzzwords of big data and AI, machine learning. Um, anywhere we can use human or animal data, um, so share that data and uh, be able to use that to look at drug responses and diseased or healthy individuals can actually replace animal use. Um, and finally, invertebrate models um, and zebrafish embryos um, are also uh, in, in this area. So this really brings me on to thinking about a full uh, versus partial replacement. So we think of um, as replacement as being in two halves. Uh, full replacement where no animal is required, but partially, a partial replacement um, would be where you use an animal which is not currently considered capable of experiencing suffering. So this includes invertebrates, Drosophila nematode worms, and also larval forms such as uh, larval, larval zebrafish. This also includes primary cells taken from an animal killed solely for this purpose, obviously in line with the relevant legislation. So, there are multiple benefits of applying uh, replacements in scientific research. Um, the, one of the obvious problems with using animals for research is that animals and humans have metabolic, cellular and anatomical differences, and I think this is, this is fairly obvious. But what this means is that animal models can sometimes give misleading results um, due to these differences with humans. Um, so using a human-based uh, cell or tissue model can overcome some of these uh, species differences. Uh, it, within the pharmaceutical research industry and when, when trying to design new drugs for patients, uh, a lack of prediction of human effects in animal models uh, can hamper this. Um, it can work in a drug uh, failing, uh, it can result in a drug failing to work later on uh, during the uh, development period. 
or indeed it can reduce the efficacy of this drug uh, when it once it gets to the clinic. And these are neither of these things are good for either the pharmaceutical industry or for patients who who need new treatments. Um, and the poor application of animal modelling can also result in toxicity of new drugs under development not being well defined. So really, replacement technologies can give us a more detailed information, often in a reductionist manner, about um, a, a biological situation. And increasingly, biological pathways and targets can be studied uh, without using animals, although that is on a case-by-case -case basis at the moment. Thank you, and I'll, I'll hand back to Megan. Thank you so much, Sam. Next, we're going to have Chuan Chiang of Mimetis. She's a scientist in the model development team where she develops 3D CNS on a chip models. She received her master's degree in biomedical sciences in the Netherlands, and her main interest during the bachelor's degree was immunology. She's gained research experience at the Weatherall Institute of Molecular Medicine at the University of Oxford as well. During her master's, she focused on research in neuroscience, and the aim of her dissertation was to assess the role of astrocytes and axonal damage in vanishing white matter disease. She also investigated the role of microglia and glioblastoma by isolating cells from patients' tumor material at the University Medical Center. At Mimetis, she's developed a 3D CNS model for high throughput neurotoxicity and seizure liability testing. She also focuses on developing 3D Parkinson's disease models for screening of novel drug candidates. And with that, I will hand it over to Chuan Xiang. Thank you, Megan. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation for the webinar. Today, I will give you an introduction to our company. So, Nimetas, we are a biotech company based in Leiden, in the Netherlands. And I will uh, show you our culture platform and uh, give a case study on how we can apply this in the three R's and today focused on replacement. Next slide. So, here is today's uh, webinar outline. I will short talk about uh, Mimedas, the company itself, and then give you an introduction to the Organoplate platform. And then when I introduce you to the Organoplate platform, also uh, show you how we use this in uh, developing a CNS model and uh, show you a bit of background, the model setup uh, results and conclusion of this study, and then a brief summary. Next slide, please. So this is Mimetal's uh, mission. So our mission is actually providing human tissue and organ models for 21 first century therapeutics. So better medicines and personalized medicine, uh, personalized therapies. And uh, that's because we all want better medicine, but to make that possible, we need better disease models that are fully human and physiological relevant. So actually we need better models that show better productivity as compared to uh, in vivo models now and the conventional cell culture models. Next slide, please. So of course, 2D cultures are uh, simple and easy to use and they've been used for many years, um, but they don't always resemble the in vivo situation. And of course, with animal models, with animal testing, you're closer to the in vivo situation, but they're often time consuming, expensive, and not high throughput. And they don't always predict the human outcome. So ideally you want to test the drug, of course, in a human, but that's not possible for many reasons. So we need better in vitro tissues model that can recapitulate the in vivo situation. And that's why you see in the middle that we develop the organoplate. An organoplate is a simple culture platform that can support the growth of complex 3D tissues. Uh, this organoplate is a microfluidic culture platform that enable high throughput membrane-free culturing and we can induce flow uh, without uh, using pumps, which I will show later. Next slide. If you first focus on the left uh, top corner, you can see the organoplate two-lane. Uh, as you see, it is based on a 384 wells uh, plate, which is a normal wells, that, uh, wells plate that you can find in any lab. And you can see the microfluidic chip at the bottom. With this two lane, you have 96 individual chips on one plate. 
and the bottom of the plate is made from high quality glass. So this makes it compatible for high throughput content imaging. And also because it's a regular 384 Wells plate, is it is compatible with any high content microscope and uh, any other laboratory device that you have. If you look at uh, the chip layout of a two lane, you can see that every four wells contains one chip and every well have their own purpose. So we have a, a well where we called the where you have access to the ECM channel and two of the wells give you access to the perfusion channel and another one is actually the well where you see your cells. So if you look at the right upper picture you can see that uh, the small ridge between the two channels that is indicated as the phase guide. So the organoplate it's based on this technology and the phase guide actually function as a pressure barrier so that if you apply liquid in one channel, it doesn't cross the other barrier and flow into the other channel. And that's how we can grow cells uh, in ECM, for example, into one channel and then have the other channel accessible for medium. So if you look at the bottom left picture, you can see the three link organoplate, plate, also based on 384 Wells plate, but then with three channels instead of two channels which means that the layout of the chip is a bit different because nine wells contains one chip. And what you will see with three lane is that instead of one phase guide, we have two phase guide, which enables um, the growing of different configurations. Next slide. Um, so with this video, I show you how actually the organoplate works. So you can see the different channels and the phase guide. And this is actually how you put gel in a plate using a normal pipette. And by capillary force, the cells embedded here in ECM, depicted in red, are flown into one channel. And as you can see in the middle, you can see the phase guide, which makes sure that the ECM with the cells doesn't cross to another channel but rather form a meniscus on the top of the plate. Next. So when we apply another liquid, in this case, medium, depicted in blue, you can see that uh, it will flow into the channel and there's a, oh, sorry. So no, sorry. This is another type of video that shows how we can also do another type of growing where we grow the cells instead of in the ECM against the ECM. So here you can see that we can grow cells in tubal structures against ECM, and you have access to the lumen side, so the apical and basal lateral side. Next slide, please. In this slide, I show you how we can induce perfusion. So we aim for an easy to use platform and instead of attaching our system to a pumping system, we induce flow by putting them on the Mimetos rocker, which you can see on the left picture. With this rocker system, we introduce flow with passive leveling of the liquid. So as you can see in the uh, small animation on the right, the rocker tilt from one side to another side. So the medium that is applied in the, one, in the inlet is flowing toward the medium to the outlet and all the way around. So you have a bi-directional flow in our system. Next slide. Here I want to show you a couple of different co-culture configurations that you can uh, do in organoplate. So with the two lane, we have two channels, which mean you can either embed your cells in ECM or you can grow a tubal structure against the ECM. But it is also possible to grow actually both of them. So having the e cells in ECM and then growing a tubal structure against the ECM. Next, please. And with the three lane, of course, you have three channel, which means you can have many more options in the different configuration in co-culturing. So you can either have double uh, cells in ECM, or you can only have one cell in ECM, or actually two tubal structure and one channel filled with cells in ECM. So the options are 
more in the three lane and there are different configuration you can apply in organoplate. Next, please. Here are a couple of pictures of different organ models we developed at organoplate, uh, with organoplate and Mimetos. So on the left, you can see some solid tissue that we use where we embed the cells in ECM. So these are the liver model, the brain model I will talk about today. Some organoid work, and then we grow um, tubal structures, which, which you can see on the right, which are kidney uh, epithelial cells, vasculature, our gut models. And then we can also use the organoplate for different co-culture models, like for studying kidney clearance, uh, studying the blood-brain barrier, or making endothelium parasite co-cultures. Next slide. So now I introduce you to the organoplate technology. I will show you how we can use the organoplate in developing more relevant in vitro models that uh, can replace in vivo experiments in the future in say nest pharmacology. So in CNS uh, safety pharmacology, they mainly make use of in vivo methods. So if, if you look at uh, the top uh, left uh, pictures, you can see that when uh, there are neurotoxicity studies, they mainly assess potential functional impairments using the in vivo mod, uh, methods. And a few examples of them are looking at their behavior, do they, does it change? Um, do they change in learning and memory function? Or do they gain uh, or loss of sensory and motor function? Seizure assessment in safety pharmacology are mainly based on ex vivo assays. And they are performed uh, with electrophysiological re recordings on organotypic slices, and then afterward also performed in in vivo models, of course. So the current in vitro screening models are mainly based on red cortical primary cultures. So that's the golden standard right now. And uh, they combine it with the electrophysiological recordings, mainly done with this multi electrode array platform, but also patch clamping. Next slide. But what are actually the limitations with the current CNS model? So, as I said, a lot of um, CNS models and uh, experiments are still done on uh, animals. But um, there are a lot of, there are a large number of animals needed and used for one experiment. And they're not only very costly, but also it raises concern, of course, about animal welfare. And then another limitation is that the conventional 2D cultures, like the primary red cortex cells, they uh, lack the ability to recapitulate the, complex, com the complexity of the brain, which is that they, um, fails to mimic the ramified 3D network and 3D structures that you normally see in vivo. And then uh, also with animal use, um, it offer the complexity that we lack in the 2D cultures, but they often lack productivity for the human outcome in mainly in neurotoxicity studies. Next. So in the coming slide, I will show you how we developed the CNS uh, model in organoplate and the case study that we did in combination uh, together with NC3R. So as you see here on the left, it's just a two-lane organoplate. And then on the right, it's stepwise um, depicted on how we actually do the seeding. So on A, you can see a empty chip. And in B, you can see that we mix neurons with astrocytes in ECM, and in this case, it's metrogel, and it's um, added in the, uh, in the gel channel, which is the bottom channel. In C, uh, depicted in pink now is the medium, so we apply the medium, and in D is the, shown uh, how the network will form and how the culture will grow out. And then in the bottom, you can see a phase contrast image of the cultures at day seven um, of a two lane. Next, please. Here you can see the same culture and then uh, stained using immunofluorescent 
using the Marcus uh, beta 3 tubulin for the neurons in green, uh, GFAP for the astrocytes, and in red. So what you can see that there's a nice network formation in organoplate, and if you click next, the video shows how they really grow nicely in 3D. So it's a video from the bottom to the top of the plate. Next. So in the study that I'm going to show today, we developed what we called the neural screen 3D. So a 3D CNS model that is supported, that was supported by NC3R. And what we did here is actually we wanted to develop a 3D neuronal model that contained mixed neuronal and non-neuronal subtype. So we chose to use neurons and astrocytes. And for this, we um, developed different assays where we could look uh, at neuroid outgrowth, the cell viability of the cells, the mitochondrial toxicity after applying a compound, and also looking at calcium homeostasis, so uh, looking at the activity of the neurons. And then we had two different aims, predict toxicity using the first three assays and validate a whole compound library using calcium homeostasis, where we validated this CNS model with nine potential uh, compounds that should induce seizure. Uh, two of them should uh, inhibit it and we had one control. Next. So to do the readout for the activity of the neurons in the organoplate, we actually use calcium imaging. So what we did is we applied a uh, fluorescent calcium indicator, which is called CAL520, which binds to free, free calcium and it can, uh, you can image it with the uh, microscope. And with this, we can also look at the activity of a neuron. So when the neurons are active, a downstream effect of the activity of an action potential is of course the influx of, and outflux of the efflux of the calcium in the neurons. So when we image the uh, fluctuation of the calcium within and outside the cells, we can actually look at the activity of the neurons. And with this, we can detect the activity uh, in burst frequency. So how often do we see activity? Uh, how intense are they? And how long are they? Next. And with this video, this is an example how we actually can show the activity. It's a recording of two minutes of the activity of the cells where we image the fluorescent dye, which indicates activity of the neurons. Next. We also developed a whole analysis process uh, in order to quantify this activity in a CNS model. So we do a lot, couple steps, so beginning with bleach correction. So we correct for the fluorescent changes over time. And what we can do afterwards is actually we can segmentate and detect the activity of individual neurons from all the neurons that we have in our culture. And then we can extract the trace per neuron in our culture. And then we have different ways to, do, uh, to show the activity like the video I showed you in the previous slide. And then from that, we can ex extract data and plot it in different kind of graphs. Next. And what we can do is actually detect synchronicity. So the whole aim of this project was to see if we can detect synchronicity induced by certain compounds. So what you can see here on the top video is a baseline activity of the CNS culture. In the bottom, we applied 4AP, which is a potassium channel blocker. And what you can see is that the neurons start to fire at the same time, which we call synchronicity. Uh, next. What we can do is then quantify this, uh, show this synchronized activity in different kind of graphs. Next. So the blue line is the baseline activity and the orange one is after applying the compound. And then what we can show is that um, we can show the synchronicity increase from baseline, but we can also show every individual neurons how active they are. So in the right graph, you see every black dot is one individual neurons. So when we don't apply any compound, 
based on the activity of the uh, whole culture is rather uh, um, um, it's not uh, at the same time but when you add for AP which is the compound you can see that the neurons fire all at the same time which is what the compound is supposed to do next so here is the uh, library that we actually screened for this project and you can see that we had compounds of different uh, categories and uh, next today I will focus on uh, one of the potassium channel compounds which is linoperidine two of the antibiotics we just tested and then one of the compound that actually should inhibit the activity which is phenytoin next So on this slide, I want to show you how we actually can induce seizure by linopidin. Linopidin blocks the potassium channel, so it increases the, act, uh, the, the duration also and the intensity of an action potential of the neurons. Next. So on the top video, you can see the baseline activity of the neurons, which is kind of random. And then next, in the bottom video, when we apply linopidin, you can see that many parts of the cultures fire at the same time. So we really induce synchronicity uh, in the cultures. Next. What we then can do is extract the data and plot it in graph. So we did a whole concentration range from one micromolar to thousand micromolar linopidin. And we can really see an increase in uh, activity. So in birth frequency, mainly, and also in burst intensity, which increases until 30 micromolar, and then it starts to decrease again. Next slide. Here you can see the results of one of the antibiotics, which is anoxacin. And then again, we did a concentration range, and uh, we can see significant increase of burst frequency and burst intensity after applying this antibiotic to the CNS co-culture. And then in the bottom is antibiotic amoxicillin that we tried with different concentration. And again, we can see a significant increase in activity in burst frequency and intensity of the cultures. Next. So here I want to show you how we actually can inhibit again the seizure that we induce with the compound. In the top video, you can see the activity of the culture when we applied the linoperidin. So it really increases the activity and some parts of the culture start to synchronize. And then uh, next, if we apply phenytoin, which should normally inhibit the activity, we can see that the activity of the whole culture decreases and the synchronicity we can see that we after applying linoperidin, it is also not visible anymore. And when we quantify it, we can see that there is a significant decrease with one concentration of phenytoin in burst intensity, and there's a slight decrease in burst frequency as well. Since I don't want to discuss all of the compounds, here I can see a, uh, a summary of the results of uh, all the compounds. So we actually found a uh, very strong effect of five of the nine compounds that should increase seizure. So with linoperidin, for aminopyridin, with the two antibiotics, and PTZ, we really saw an increase in activity. Well, with four of the other compounds, we saw a minor effect. And then we were able to induce seizure and also inhibit again with the chlorpromazine and phenytoin. Next. So to summarize, we developed an IPS-derived co-culture of neurons and astrocytes, and the culture showed marked expression of mature neurons and astrocytes. Uh, what we could do is uh, make a culture with a 3D network that was formed within 24 hours with these IPS-derived cells. And this 3D co-culture is applicable for neurotoxicity screening. Uh, mainly using cell viability assay, mitochondrial toxicity assays, neurot outgrowth assays, and using calcium imaging, we can also assess the seizure of uh, potential seizure of certain compounds. 
So with this, I want to conclude um, what I showed. So what I want to say is that uh, the Organoplate is a suitable platform to enable replacement of animal use in cna safe pharmacology, uh, mainly because these models that we develop are more relevant in vitro models that enables us to replace the in vivo work in the future. And then uh, I want to say that we also have some other CNS disease model uh, that we developed that is applicable for neurotoxic screening and drug screening, which are Parkinson's disease models and Alzheimer's disease model. And of course, we work on uh, other organ models besides the CNS and the brain. And one of example that we have is a study that we also did with NC3R, where we developed a kidney model to screen for nephrotoxicity. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, the first question is for Dr. Jackson. Uh, Sam, do you foresee any regulatory issues with replacement technology and their use in drug development? Um, that's a really good question. Um, and yes, so there, um, there's a paradigm right now where the regulators will need to be on board with uh, replacement technologies. And in actual fact, um, regulatory guidance currently says that animals need to be used um, to, in regulatory submissions. Um, we, as an organisation, work very closely with regulators um, and talk to them a lot about this kind of issue. Um, and actually opinion is split even within that group um, quite widely as to the applicability of in vitro modeling and actually a lot of regulators right now are saying we really love to see the data from these kind of models because we need to be able to uh, compare that with the relevant animal models as laid out in the guidelines but also to get more experience really of working with that kind of data so the kind of data that you are showing you today uh, perhaps is not so familiar to a regulator and when they get a, a package onto their desk and they're, they're looking through it and incredibly busy people that they are, they might not have time to necessarily uh, appreciate the ins and outs of, of your new in vitro model and indeed it's not their job to do due diligence on that. Having said that, they are very interested, as I said, to, to a lot of people, a lot of regulators we talk to are very interested to see this kind of data so that they can start to uh, factor it into their equations. Um, and I do think that in the longer term, there is support for uh, replacement technologies um, with, with the regulatory agencies. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, the next question is for Chuan. Uh, what other areas of application do you anticipate for the organoplate technology and are some more critical than others? So um, actually we use the organoplate for a lot of different fields. So now I only showed a case study for the CNS model, but um, we are working toward another, a lot of different models that I showed you in a slide. And um, we also really eager to um, develop a, uh, eager to provide the platform for uh, work for uh, cancer models and tumor models and of course the uh, organoid work that is really uh, being done a lot nowadays. Excellent, that leads into another question for you. Are there any limits on the types of cells that can be used in the organoplate? Um, in principle, not. Of course, every cell type needs their own optimization and some cells need longer optimization than others, of course. Uh, we mainly use uh, in, the, in animators human-based cells, but actually we use all kinds of cells like ips derived but also primary cells, um, but also cancer cell lines uh, or organoid or tumor cells. That, that Those are the type of cells that we use. Excellent, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Jackson. Um, can you elaborate on why invertebrate modeling is an effective replacement given that the metabolic and cellular differences with humans still exist? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think that this really gets at, at that point. It's a, it's a very good point. Um, if you're using a mouse to model a human disease, then that actually may have more face validity or may, may have more biological validity than using a fruit fly or a worm. Um, fruit flies and worms particularly have been used in biology uh, due to the tractability of their uh, genetics. And so you can do a lot of uh, experiments very quickly uh, by breeding fruit flies and, uh, and worms and seeing how um, changes in uh, a specific piece of the genetic code leads to uh, a developmental or, or a change in that way. Um, 
really, I believe personally that given that they are uh, these kind of organized organisms are seen as, as, in inverted commas, lower organisms. And as I said, there isn't currently evidence that they are able to experience pain. You can use them as whole animal models for certain um, experiments. So I guess a good example of that would be uh, the zebrafish larvae. So, um, for instance, a couple of key points about zebrafish larvae are that they are uh, transparent and very small, um, and, but they do have a fully intact vasculature, uh, which you can actually image through the, the body of the animal. Um, and so you can start to do experiments where you look at, for instance, trafficking of cells through the vasculature, which, which could be um, applicable to, to cancer research, for instance. So there are areas where um, you can use invertebrate models as whole whole animal models and a and, and whole physiological system um, to look at a particular area of biology. Um, having said that, I, I would not say that, um, for instance, an invertebrate model would be uh, closer to uh, the human situation in, in terms of that. So yeah, it's, it's about, I believe, picking uh, the right model for the right scenario. Great, thank you. And then the last question is for Chuan. Uh, do you see any potential to apply the organoplate technology to the other areas of CNF safety pharmacology, um, like neurotoxicity? Is there any potential for that in the future and prediction? Yes, so I actually only showed one part of this project that we did with NC3R, which was assessing the uh, seizure liability of the compound. Uh, but actually, we also applied um, a known neurotoxicant to, the, uh, to this model where we assessed the cell viability of uh, the culture and we looked at if the compound uh, actually affected the whole culture and if the mitochondria were also affected. So yes, for sure, there, there is potential to use this CNS model also for other areas of neurotoxicity. Great, thank you. And then there's another new question. Um, Sam, you can answer this in conjunction with myself, I think. And this one is, I understand that all R's are important and should be used together, but when a company is making an effort to move away from animal models, which R do you feel they start with more commonly, or is it always applying all three? Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, in actual fact, in my experience, it's quite difficult to apply all three R's to one um, given research model. I think that when a, an organization, company or lab is using um, animals, and let, let's say that's uh, mice uh, in this instance for research, um, in actual fact, my, my, my feeling is that the most important thing to get right there is the refinement aspect. And so to make sure that the welfare of those animals is being looked after uh, as well as is humanly possible. And that's from a, uh, from a wealth, animal welfare point of view, but also really from a scientific point of view, the better um, animals are looked after and the better um, they are kept in, in um, physiological conditions and they're not too cold, they're not too hot and the light cycles are correct. And these things are taken into account even before you get to doing things like like, um, enriching their cages that can really uh, bolster the quality of uh, up to data that you get out of those animals I think that um, replacement is actually quite a bit up big ask and so the things that Mimetas are doing are really quite remarkable in that you can start to um, do some of these experiments outside of an animal but those are a little further down the track and as I said may not be applicable in in, um, in, in a majority of cases so yeah my, my answer would be um, while I think that reducing and replacing animal use is incredibly important as, and will be something that will be increasing in the future, I believe that given that we're using animals currently uh, in our labs and in our experiments, that the, the welfare aspect and so the refinement aspect has to be paramount. I agree 100%. I think that when labs are starting to move towards this, it's easiest to start with what you know and what you're doing already. And so if you already have mice in house or other animals, it's, um, it can be easier to kind of start that refinement process and then move on to the other R's as possible. Yeah. Uh, there's another question here for Chuan. Uh, how many animals can your product replace as an estimate? Um, I think that's a really hard estimation because, of course, I'm not really aware of how and how many animals is really used in one experiment. But if you think about that one organoplate, uh, the two lay that I showed with the CNS model contain 96 chips. So one organoplate can actually already replace 96 uh, animals per experiment. So you can imagine that it can indeed replace quite a lot of animals if you can apply this for your toxicity study. 
Fantastic, thank you. Okay, and I think that was all of the questions that we have for today. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap up the webinar. Uh, thank you so much to my co-host Sam and uh, Chuan for presenting. If you have any questions or you want to get in touch with us, our information is available. And of course, this webinar uh, was recorded and will be available for uh, later viewing and listening. Thanks so much for joining Scientist.com and we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.